Small Things, for which she received the 1997 Booker Prize. Uh, she has written several nonfiction books, including The Cost of Living, Power Politics, War Talk, An Ordinary Person's Guide to Empire, Public Power in the Age of Empire. It says here that your new book is Field Notes on Democracy, but then it's, it's Broken Republic, it's since then. So that's your newest book, is Broken Republic, right? So yeah, her, so her second new book is Field Notes on Democracy, Listen to Grasshopper, and her new book is Broken Republic, which is absolutely fantastic, I think the best one. Um, anyway, so here's Anne Barney Orton. delighted I was to look at all this trouble that's brewing in paradise. resistance that has been discussed here in theory is being carried out in practice where I live. And, uh, and so to begin with, I want to salute the people who live in one of the poorest countries in the world, India, for stopping some of the biggest corporations in their tracks for the last five or six years. So let's just say... So, so, you know, I don't know how far back in history to begin, so I'll, 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 I'll lay the milestone down in the recent past. Let's say in the early 90s, um, when uh, capitalism won its war against Soviet communism in the bleak mountains of Afghanistan, the Indian government, which had been um, for many years one of the leaders of the non-aligned movement, suddenly became a completely aligned country and began to call itself the nat natural ally of uh, the US and Israel. And it opened up its protected markets to global capital. So, so what I'm going to talk about is roughly what happened in the last, let's say, 20, 21 years. And though, though what most people have been speaking about is about environmental battles, in the real world, actually, it's quite hard to separate these things. You know, um, the war on terror, for example, the depleted uranium, the missiles, the fact that it was the military industrial complex that actually uh, pulled the US out of the depression, out of the Great Depression. And since then, the economies of countries like America, many countries in Europe, certainly Israel, have depended very largely on the manufacture of weapons. And what good are weapons if they're not going to be used in wars? So, so, the, uh, so, so it's absolutely essential. It's not just for oil or for natural resources, but for the military industrial complex itself to keep going that we need weapons. So today, as we speak, um, the US and perhaps China and India are involved in a battle for control 
of the resources of Africa. Tens of thousands of U.S. Uh, troops are being sent, death squads and troops are being sent into Africa. The, the yes we can, President has expanded the war from Afghanistan into Pakistan with drone attacks, killing children every day there. But what, I mean, just to, just to look at the process of how, how uh, things panned out in India, before I begin to, to read to you from the Broken Republic, which is actually called Walking with the Comrades here in, in the US, um, I just want to, you know, sort of structurally put something in place. So in the 1990s, when, when, when the markets of India opened, when all the laws that protect labor were dismantled, when uh, natural resources were privatized and the whole process was set into motion, uh, the Indian government basically opened two locks. One was the lock of the markets and the other was the lock of an old 14th century mosque called the Babri Masjid, which was a disputed site between Hindus and Muslims because the Hindus believed that it was the birthplace of, of Ram and the Muslims of course used it as a mosque. And by opening that lock, it set into motion a kind of conflict between the majority community and, and the minority community, a way of constantly dividing people. And this is the main practice of anybody that is, that is in power. How do you divide people? It doesn't, uh, and, and so this was one of them. So the opening of these two locks unleashed two kinds of totalitarianism in India. One was economic totalitarianism, and the other was, uh, you know, Hindu fundamentalism. And both these processes manufactured two kinds of what the government calls terrorism. So you had Islamist terrorists, and you had today what the government calls Maoists, which means anybody who's resisting the project of civilization, of progress, of development, Anybody who's resisting the takeover of their lands or the destruction of rivers and forests is today a Maoist. Yes, there are Maoists. They are the most militant end of a bandwidth of re resistance movements starting from the Gandhi to the Maoists. And what kind of strategy people will choose or adopt to resist the, the, the onslaught of global capital quite often is not an ideological choice, it's a tactical choice depending on the landscape in which those battles are being fought. But all, everybody is, is a Maoist. I mean just this morning I received an email from India talking about a, a woman called Soni Sori, an uh, indigenous tribal woman who, who'd just been arrested the day before or a few days before I left India and you know, she's now been held and tortured and been asked to name some of us as the sort of overground leaders of the Maoist movement, which is absolutely ridiculous. But anyway, ever since India became, ever since India became a sovereign republic, it has deployed its army against what it calls its own people since 1947. In Manipur, in Nagaland, in Mizoram, in, in Kashmir, where there are 700,000 Indian troops, where there were 165,000 American troops in the war in Iraq. And now, gradually, those, those countries, those states where, where the troops were deployed were, were people who were fighting for self-determination. They were states that the Indian, the decolonized Indian state immediately colonized. But now those troops are actually, um, are actually defending the government's rights to build big dams, to build power projects, to, to carry out the processes of privatization. In the last uh, 50 years, more than 30 million people have been displaced by big dams alone in India. And of course, most of those are indigenous people or uh, people who live on the land, the live off the land. The, um, so the results of 20 years of this kind of free market and this 
this bogey of terrorism has resulted in the hollowing out of democracy. So I notice a lot of people <coughs> use democracy as a good word. <coughs> but, but, but actually, if you think of it, democracy today is not what democracy used to be. There was a time when the American government was toppling democracies in Latin America and all over the place. Today, it's waging wars to install democracy because it has taken democracy into the workshop and hollowed it out. It has uh, every institution of democracy, let's say in India, whether it's the courts, whether it's the parliament, whether it's the press, all of it has been hollowed out and harnessed to the free market. So you have these empty rituals, but what actually happens is it continues to militarize. It continues to become a police state, which is what has happened in India. So in the last 20 years, after we embraced the free market, uh, 250,000 farmers have committed suicide because they have been driven into debt. 250,000 farmers. It has never happened in human history before. And yet, you know, obviously when the establishment has a choice between suicide farmers and suicide bombers, you know which ones they are going to encourage. They don't mind that statistic because they, it, it helps them. They feel sorry, they, they make a few noises, but they keep doing what they're doing. Today, India has more poor people than all the poorest countries of Africa put together. And it has 80% of its population living on less than 20 rupees a day, which is less than 50 cents a day. So that is the atmosphere in which the resistance movements are operating. And of course, it has a media, which I, I don't know any other country which has so many news channels, all of them sponsored by, either directly owned by corporations, some of them mining corporations, infrastructure corporations, and some of them, of I mean, more than 99% of, of all news is funded by corporate advertising. So you can imagine what's going on with that. Uh, we have a Prime Minister, the Prime Minister of the world's largest democracy, Manmohan Singh, who was more or less installed by the IMF. He has never won an election in his life. He never stood for, never, I mean, he stood for one election loss, but after that he was just placed there. And, and um, he's the person who actually, when he was finance minister, dismantled all the laws that allowed global capital into India. I remember uh, at, at one time I was uh, at, a, at a meeting of iron ore workers and, uh, and uh, Manmohan Singh, the prime minister at that time, was the leader of the opposition and a Hindi poet uh, read out a poem, it was called Manmohan Singh kya kar raha hai aajkal, which means what is Manmohan Singh doing these days? And it started, and the first two lines were Manmohan Singh kya kar raha hai aajkal, vish kya karta hai khoon mein utarne ke baad, what does poison do after <coughs> it's entered the bloodstream? You know, because they knew that, 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 that whatever he had to do was done, and now it's just a question of it taking its course. So, um, in 2005, which was the second term of the present government, the Indian government signed hundreds of memorandums of understanding with mining companies, with infrastructure companies, and so on, to convert a huge swathe of forest land in central <coughs> India. India has 100 million indigenous peoples. And they have, if you look at a map of India, the minerals, the forests, and the indigenous people are all stacked up, one on top of the other. And so these uh, memorandums of understanding were signed with these mining companies uh, in 2005. 
at the very uh, and at the same time that those memorandums of understanding were signed in in the state of Chhattisgarh, which is which is where this great civil war is unfolding now, the government raised a tribal militia, which was funded by these corporations, to basically go through the forest and try and clear it of people so that the, the MOUs, the Memorandums of Understanding, could be actualized. So the media started to call this, 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 this whole swathe of forest the Maoist corridor. Well, some of us used to call it the MOUist corridor. And um, around that time, they, uh, they announced a, a war, basically. It was called Operation Green Hunt. And 200,000 paramilitary began to move into the forests, along, and along with this tribal militia, to, to, to clear it of what the government called Maoists. Now, the Maoist movement in various avatars has existed in India since 1967, which was the first time there was an uprising in a village in West Bengal called Naxalbari. So the Maoists are sometimes called Naxalites. And of course, it's an underground <coughs> band party. It has now a People's Liberation Guerrilla Army. Um, you know, thousands and thousands of people have been killed in this conflict. Today, there are thousands of people in prison. And all of them are called Maoists, though not all of them are Maoists. Because, as I said, anybody who resists today is being called a terrorist. Poverty and terrorism have been conflated. And we have laws like in, in um, Kashmir and in the northeastern states, you have the Armed Forces Special Powers Act, which allows soldiers to kill on suspicion. In central India, you have laws like, I mean, all over India, you have the Unlawful Activities Prevention Act, which basically makes even thinking an anti-government thought a criminal offense, for which you can be jailed for more than seven years. So this is the atmosphere that was being created, and the media was in this orgy of, you know, these Maoist terrorists. They were conflating them with the lashkar e taiba you know, so you see them on TV with so ski masks and AK-47s, and, 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 and the middle class was literally baying for their blood. And at this time, um, I, I had written a couple of, um, you know, a couple of articles about, about the whole thing where television anchors would just turn around and look at me as if I was crazy when I mentioned mining, you know. What was the, co what was the connection between pure evil guerrillas and, mine, and good mining corporations, you know. So the, the, I mean, in this book, uh, Field Notes on Democracy, there are, there's a point where the Supreme Court of India actually gave a judgment saying you cannot possibly accuse a corporation of malpractice. In so many words, it just says so. So it was around that time that a note was slipped under my door inviting me to go into the forest and walk with the comrades. So I'm going to read to you from that just to give you a texture and a sense of what is going on there. The terse typewritten note slipped under my door in a sealed envelope, confirmed my appointment with India's single biggest internal security challenge, which is what the Prime Minister called the Maoists. I've been waiting for months to hear from them. I had to be at the Ma Danteshwari Mandir, that's temple, in Dantewara, Chhattisgarh, at any four given times on two given days. That was to take care of bad weather, punctures, blockades, transport strikes, and sheer bad luck. The note said, writer should have camera, tikka, which is a bindi, and coconut. Meter will have cap, Hindi Outlook magazine, and bananas. The password will be Namaskar Guruji. Namaskar Guruji. 
I wondered whether the meter and retail would be expecting a man and whether I should get myself a moustache. <laughs> Thanks everybody for being here and for inviting me here. I can't tell you how delighted I was to look at all this trouble that's brewing in paradise. <laughs> on Democracy, Listen to Grasshopper, and her new book is Broken into the Public, which is absolutely fantastic. I think the best one. Um, anyway, so here's Andrade Orton. saying that every kind of resistance that has been discussed here in theory is being carried out in practice where I live. And, um, and so to begin with, I want to salute the people who live in the small for which she received the 1997 Booker Prize. Uh, she has written several non-fiction books, including The Cost of Living, Power Politics, War Talk, An Ordinary Person's Guide to Empire, Public Power in the Age of Empire. It says here that your new book is Field Notes on Democracy, but then it's Broken Republic, it's since then. So that's your newest book, is Broken Republic, right? So yeah, her, so her second new book is... Live in one of the poorest countries in the world, India, for stopping some of the biggest corporations in their tracks for the last five or six years. So let's just say... I don't know how far back in history to begin, so I'll, 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 